Hello and welcome to episode two of our still unnamed podcast. It's not for a lack of trying. We've, uh, we have we we did try to come up with a title for this. Maybe for episode three, we'll have a title. But my name is Joel. And I'm Martin. Today, we will be reviewing Bad Lieutenant, Port of Call, New Orleans. A starring, wonderful, a wonderful remake. Starring Nicolas Cage. When did this come out? Is this this year? This is uh, 2009. 2009. Okay, so great. great. Copyrighted date here on the side. Martin, I believe you did not see the original Bad Lieutenant. Is that correct? That is 100% accurate. I did. I actually own the original. And uh, just a quick synopsis of that one. Bad Lieutenant is essentially about uh, the titular Bad Lieutenant starring Harvey Keitel. And uh, he's not as bad as you think. I think he's addicted to drugs. He has a gambling problem. And uh, he does some bad things to uh, innocent people, which I'll talk about that later, as it sort of pertains to this this movie. Well, you said in comparison to how bad Nicolas Cage is as a lieutenant in this movie, Harvey Keitel, I guess, is a morally confused lieutenant? Yeah. Well, this, this movie is neither a sequel nor a remake. It's completely separate, and we'll talk about that in a second. Can you give us a quick plot synopsis of Bad Lieutenant? Yeah, sure. Okay, the movie starts out with Nicolas Cage working as a lieutenant on a homicide investigative team. And it starts out with a back injury where he is prescribed Vicodin. From there, it's a slippery slope down a never-ending cocaine, crack, heroin, marijuana, Vicodin... I didn't see any hallucinogens, but I tried to keep track of all the drugs he took. Whatever. Lost lost track maybe after 15 minutes. And he is trying to solve a murder of five innocent people in a post-Katrina New Orleans. And he does that by trying to take down a quite influential drug dealer through essentially breaking every law and moral code that any officer of the law should uphold. That all sounds pretty straightforward. That sounds like a pretty average, simple, police procedural, law and order kind of plot line. But the reality is a little different. In the very first scene of the movie, Nicolas Cage and Fat Val Kilmer, are, uh, they're rescuing somebody who's drowning in a prison. That's unfair. He's, it's, it's more like a chubby Val. He's chubby Val Kilmer. Chubby, he's he's chubby not Val Batman Kilmer. anymore. No, he's not. And uh, <laughs> there's, I don't know, he was never Batman to me. okay well the first thing that starts off in this movie is him jumping into water and rescuing a prisoner from drowning the beginning of the movie and then immediately it cuts to him being injured i was really unclear whether as to whether or not that is what what broke his back or something him jumping in the water according to wikipedia it is but I, i didn't get that sense at all from this movie either did i the scene jumped immediately from being in a dank, dark prison with a man drowning, I'm assuming from Hurricane Katrina, to him being in a sunny doctor's office going, well, am I going to have back pain forever? (laughs) Come on, man, work with me. You know, one of the questions I had in my mind when I was watching this movie is, how many times have we seen Nicolas Cage play a cop or some sort of law and order kind of guy? What can you think of the top of your head? The first, like law or prison related movie that comes to just just law related would be con air because he played he played <laughs> a he, Mar- he played he, he, he played he, no, or no, no 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 that was john cusack's character he played originally he was in the military he was a military officer who was put in prison for killing somebody in a bar fight i think that's the last michael bay movie that i actually enjoyed i think i disagree with you i never enjoyed any michael bay movie okay <laughs> what was he in the rock why are we bringing Mike, we're bringing Michael Bay back because into this? I'm looking at I'm looking at his uh, filmography and back to back he did The Rock and then immediately after he did Con Air. So well, well, I don't know I don't remember those movies at all. Like uh, you know, eight, eight you, millimeter. He you was really a cop. don't. You don't remember The Rock? No, it's been so long. I, I wiped it out of my mind. The I Rock. Remember, like, the, the Rock. He was in. He was in the little agent, catchphrases and stuff. Okay, Snake Eyes. Remember that? Yes. Private Investigator. Eight millimeter. Private investigator again. He's kind of gotten away from that role and jumped into a role. God, these movies now, are so bad. <laughs> now he's a man that knows something that's that no one else will believe, and only he can stop, inform, save, or I guess in in the case of knowing, get incinerated at the end. Okay, he was a cop in World Trade Center. So he was a cop in Kick Ass. 
I guess this is him getting back to his roots. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bad Lieutenant Port of Call New Orleans is Nicolas Cage getting back to his acting roots as a over the top facial actor. That's that 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 sounds like a porn a porn job, facial well, actor. But yeah. um <laughs> Now this this movie is actually was somewhat controversial in its creation because the original movie was directed by a guy called Abel Ferrara. He did the first. With the sequel, what ended up happening was from the story that I heard was that the producer of the first movie bought the rights to the name Bad Lieutenant, which gave him the ability to make any movie. He just entitled Bad Lieutenant, and he would just have a different lieutenant every time. So essentially, we have this Bad Lieutenant multiverse with a, a different lieutenant in a different city. So the original director was not happy about this at all because they completely shut him out. He has nothing to do with this new movie whatsoever. You were telling me that the directing... It's directed Nicholas, by Werner Herzog, who yeah, yeah, you're, usually a documentarian. You're, you were telling me that he Werner Herzog, mad. when he was directing it, and I guess talking to Cage about his acting, were really doing more of like a self... almost a self-parody Did of Cage's like over-the-top acting. Did it feel like that? In parts. In parts. I'd be lying if I said that it, that it didn't at certain scenes, but f- overall, no. Maybe I'm just used to him making ridiculous faces. I guess this is a perfect opportunity for you me to ask you, like, what do you think of Nicolas Cage as an actor? We have a lot of experience with his work. Nicolas Cage is a very physical actor to the point where it's forced. The way that he does his uh, hunched shoulders forward, leaning in, constantly uh, moving and gyrating in some weird way while he's talking to somebody is maybe to mask his inability to convey emotion with his speaking. I mean, he's definitely conveying something with his facial features, but I don't know if it's emotion. (laughs) Yeah, one of the big uh, plot points in this movie was that Nicolas Cage was doing drugs continuously, and that altered his personality towards the course of the movie. You'd made a list, right, of uh, what drugs he was taking. What was he on? Vicodin, cocaine, crack, heroin, marijuana. (laughs) Um... Then he went to straight, pure... Pure, uncut, right? Pure cocaine. <laughs> pure cocaine, uncut, <laughs> base. I'm going to separate that because the He highest, had a lucky crack pipe, if you remember that. He did have a lucky crack pipe. Apparently, it's it's revealed in the in the end of the movie that this lucky crack pipe was taken from the, the scene of the crime on purpose, like it was planned, so that he'd get DNA evidence of the person who committed the murders. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. You can hold that. Hold that thought. <laughs> Which is which hold is that fucking the which is unbelievable a, because he does so many drugs. I, he can barely talk at certain points in the movie. So I refuse oh, so to believe that, that plan, he had this master this plan time. to do an enormous amount of drugs to to get DNA on a crack pipe. That's that that's pretty far fetched for me. Nicolas Cage's acting was extreme in this movie. You never know which Nicolas Cage you're gonna get depending on which movie you watch. You're either gonna get the uh, the subdued, dramatic. You're going to get pensive so- <laughs> Nicolas Cage or the extreme over the top like this movie. And there's a third Nicolas Cage, which is just phoning it in Sorcerer's Apprentice. There's a phone in boorish Nicolas Cage where he talks kind of like this to everyone. He's like, uh, almost like a, a guttural moan when he talks to everyone. And he's upset with someone because he's trying to teach them something. <laughs> That's, well, the, that's, that's the third Nicolas Cage. Those, those are the movies I think he makes just for a paycheck. Because you know he is having tax trouble. Really? He's going he's gonna to stay in a cell with Wesley Snipes? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he's hang out with him? He they can, the they can talk about making Blade 7. He owes the IRS a lot of money. and uh, <laughs> I don't understand what's going on with these actors and not being able to pay taxes. Is there a different tax code for actors? Well, let, listen to some of the things that Nicholas Surely, paid. Surely they have accountants. <laughs> well, Cage has spent his money on some pretty interesting things. Listen to this. In 2007, Nicholas Cage's shopping spree entailed the purchase of three additional residences at the total cost of more than $33 million. The purchase of 22 automobiles. What was the year? Nine Rolls Royces. What was the year that he purchased the residence, just out of curiosity? Uh, 2007. 12 purchases of expensive jewelry and 47 purchases of artwork and exotic items. Here's my favorite one. One of those exotic items was a dinosaur skull of a Tarbosaurus 
of which Nicolas Cage paid $276,000 in an auction after winning a bidding contest against Leonardo DiCaprio. <laughs> what, do you, what, do you, what do you make of that? I don't know. Did they go out to the parking lot and measure their dicks afterwards? <laughs> like, I don't really understand what the point of that is. Don't you want a dinosaur skull? Of a, right, right in your living room? Um, only if it's a Tarblosaurus, I guess. I don't need, what what is that? I've never even heard of such a thing. I I don't know. And unless unless the dinosaur skull is a Velociraptor or a T Rex, no one's gonna know what the fuck it is. <laughs> what the fuck oh, is here's this a, thing? I got a picture of a, of a Tarbosaurus skull. That's that's pretty cool. <laughs> is it carnivorous or is it a herbivore? It is. Is it an omnivore? <laughs> does it eat Does it eat both plant and meat? Uh, uh, well, I'll tell you right now. It lived uh, it lived in Asia. 70 to 65 million years ago at the end of the late Cretaceous period. But what does it large, look like? Large, sharp teeth. Uh, it was a large bipedal predator weighing more than a ton. Does it have T-Rex arms where it looks like it can't? Yes, it does. It does have like little little vestigial growths on the yeah, side yeah, of Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it does. It's, it's taller than a man. So that's that's what Nicolas Cage is doing right now. He blew all his money on dinosaur bones. and uh, I think he bought a castle too. I remember hearing about that. So he needs money. You're badly. gonna have to. You're gonna have to substantiate that 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 castle uh, purchase because I don't believe you. <laughs> <laughs> the resident says one of them is a castle. He once on owned the it? medieval castle of Sloss Knightson. There you go. Stu- oh, the hey, a- hey, okay. Hey. And then after that, one one word for that: stupendous. Which also, part? in 2007, the actor purchased Midford uh-huh. Castle in Somerset, England. Two castles. He was researching his role for, sor- uh, I guess, for Sorcerer's Apprentice. He's the Sorcerer's Apprentice. He really, he, he lives, wanted, he really lives he in the lives castle. His role. He lives his role. He's that good. He's a method actor. Yeah, I'm. I'm really split on whether or not I like Nicolas Cage or not. I, I really don't know. All right. Well, let me ask you this question then: When you see a movie trailer and Nicolas Cage first shows up in it, what is your emotional response? I scoff. Okay, so then you're saying that you're out on whether or not you like him. Mm-hmm. But your first initial reaction to seeing him in a trailer laughter. is laughter. Yeah, at this point. So wouldn't it be fair to say that you dislike it? Is it too is it too hard to say that he's become self parody right now? Like that's what this movie he is. Plays Nicolas Cage. He as plays Nicola- himself. Nicolas Cage. He plays as an Nicolas extreme Cage. version of himself more often than not. I wouldn't be surprised if that's how he is in real life. Sans drugs, he just naturally has retarded facial expressions whenever he speaks to people. <laughs> <laughs> He, uh, Do you think Francis Ford Coppola is embarrassed to be related to him? <laughs> <laughs> How about that? <laughs> I, I think he's he's proud of uh, <laughs> yeah of his whatever. Yeah, if if, he, if that's the case, then Cage is related to uh, Jason Schwartzman. Yeah, he is. And uh, Sophia Coppola. That's a very powerful. That's a very powerful acting, acting family, family right there. I want to talk about the tone in this movie just a little bit. Now, this movie was very serious. Even though everything that happened in it was extremely over-the-top, absurd, and ridiculous, at no point did they wink at the camera or laugh or anything like that. Like Everything that happened was sincere, very sincere. It, it was really happening. You know, all, all, None of it was like, wink, wink, ha-ha, look at this. Even though it was, it was laughable, which I did laugh a lot. What did you think of that? I laughed for sure. You're right. It never broke down the fourth wall. Did Herzog do it on purpose? I want to say he did since you gave him that little tidbit that his directing for Nicolas Cage's acting was, you got to let the hog loose. <laughs> yeah, he was. <laughs> I want to say that this was absolutely a, a self-parody of Cage's over-the-top antics. Did you like Herzog's directing? He did a lot of really bizarre stuff. If like you're he, asking me in the particular iguana the iguana cam and the, and the gator cam, did I like that? <laughs> I don't know. <sighs> Not really. There was literally a scene that was three minutes long where it was from the, in the, key, from the, in, in the, point in the mouth of a of an iguana. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. The fuck did that have to do with anything? I don't know what purpose that served. It didn't all. serve any. It, it, it annoyed me. And then I, I laughed for like maybe the first 30 seconds and then it became annoying. <laughs> okay, so this movie does something that I've noticed recently and that you brought to my attention. It used uh, teal orange filters for yeah, the that, camera that, itself. That's, that seems to be an epidemic lately. If you look at any big Hollywood blockbuster that's come out in the past like two years or so, the color palette of almost all these movies, it's teal and orange. Whenever they're walking around, everything is color graded to being teal. When they're outside, everything is orange, orangey. Like uh, Transformers is like this. Transformers 2 is the 
the whole thing. Number one offender. This movie was pretty much teal from beginning to end. It was, and I, I guess originally, I guess a little history on that, it was first started by the Coen brothers. They pioneered the technique when they first digitally recorded an entire movie. I believe it was uh, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? And they used it in that, and it looked good because the Coen brothers are good directors, but now it's gotten to the point where, obviously, a uh, human being's skin has an, an orangey tint to it, so they're going to make the background teal so the people pop, I guess, a little bit to make it visually pleasing. It's gotten to the point where it's muting the background to the to the point where I can't even make out where they are sometimes if they're in a dark room. Even the back of the DVD, look at how orange his face is. Yeah. That is outrageous. <laughs> it looks like he's on fire. <laughs> and then the iguana, which is supposed to be green, is solid blue. All right, all right. What was the point of the iguanas in this movie? What, what purposes did they serve? There, throughout the course of this movie, iguanas appear constantly, and Nicolas Cage is the only person that can see them. What, what does that mean? I wasn't able to figure that out. I actually wasn't able to sleep last night after I saw the movie. You were just thinking about iguanas I was just thinking about night. iguanas all night. I don't know. What, what did you think the purpose of the iguanas were? Let's do something weird. Let's have something quirky here. An iguana there. I don't know. Let's take this otherwise asinine movie and put something, something artistic in it. Yeah. Was it all right? Here's here's a good question though. Was the iguana and the iguana cam itself art for art's sake in this movie? Since Herstock is a uh, director that usually does documentaries, so he doesn't really get a chance to do artistic or um, I mean not artistic but experimental things with his directing, perhaps. Yeah, I'm not that uh, well versed in all his work, so I'm not really I can't really judge him on that. But I definitely thought it was pointless having the camera inside. The iguana's mouth and like swinging around and Nicolas Cage <laughs> looking <laughs> looking down at the iguana. That that was really pointless. I thought it, it, it didn't add anything to the movie. I liked and, I liked when he slapped the iguana. Yeah, that was pretty good. One of the problems <laughs> I had with this him. thing was that I I kind of wanted this movie to be all in. Like I wanted him to just be on a rampage from beginning to end. There's a lot of downtime in this movie. It, it, it dragged. Would you, would you would you say that? You think it dragged? Every scene where he went back to his home to visit his father, I could have took like maybe a little 10 minute power nap, woke back, woke, <laughs> woke, woke yeah, back up for the rest I, of the I movie. I could have done without all that stuff. And, yeah. Um, Stifler's mom was in there. Stifler's mom was in there. All right, let's, let's talk about some of the people that were in this does, movie. Does Stifler's mom play an alcoholic in every movie she's she in? She plays like a fat, boorish, drunk kind of person. Mostly, usually. That's her thing. That's her go-to. She's, she's drunk in every movie I've seen her in. <laughs> All right, let's talk about some of the people that were in this movie. Eva Mendez. How do you think she did? Her acting was 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 decent. She looked physically gross. All right, right, come on, come on. Okay, okay, okay. On an Eva Mendez scale, she looked gross for Eva Mendez. Okay. Then later on in the movie, she decides to go to rehab, and afterwards looks extremely attractive. My big problem with uh, Eva Mendez is is my same problem with the movie. See if you recall a movie from a couple years ago called The Girl Next Door. Yeah. Remember this movie? Yeah. There's a movie where, in, in this movie, Ava Mendez played a prostitute. In The Girl Next Door, the main girl was a porn star. Both movies, we have two women that both play sexual, like people in sex professions, and they talk about it constantly. They prefer to be called ladies of the night. Yeah, sure. And at no point in the movie do you actually see them performing any sexual act whatsoever. At all. Yeah. Not even any nudity at all. It's it's used to I guess deface their character in some way. <laughs> no, I I, I no, really do. I, yeah, I, get, I yeah. really do yeah, think that that's quick, that's it's a, it's a really quick easy, easy way. way to deface their character. Yeah. So that you can add some negative aspect to their personality without actually having to film any of it. If Darren Aronofsky was directing or write, this, or, or or even write any of it, right? You don't have to write any of their actual behavior into the script. You just say. Oh, by the way, she's a prostitute. Like, if, if Aronofsky was, was directing this, it would be the most brutal... <laughs> ass. See, there, there, there'd yeah, be 25 ass-to-ass ass scenes. Yeah, you'd, um, see, you'd see it all. <laughs> now, is, is this Val Kilmer's best performance since Willow? I can't believe you just said that. The answer is yes. I'm looking over his uh, filmography, and there is not that many things I've actually seen him in. Well, Surprising, because, like... He's a pretty well-known person. Shoot. All the random movies he's been in. Yeah, yeah, let's hear it. Okay, here, I'm going to tell you the names of the movies that I've actually heard of. I'll narrow it down to that. Top Gun, Willow, The Doors, Tombstone, True Romance, Batman Forever, Heat, The... Uh, <laughs> I saw this. The Island of Dr. Moreau. 
<laughs> that was bad. <laughs> Your favorite movie. That uh, is that, that that actually is my favorite Marlon Brando movie. Yeah. It's the Island of Dr. Yeah. Moreau. The Saint. <laughs> Pollock. Hey, the the Saint was good, by the way. I actually enjoyed that movie. Wonderland, where he played John Holmes, pulled his penis oh, out yeah. in that one. Uh Entourage. Oh, Mine Hunters. Do you remember that? <laughs> <laughs> that was like that was like stealth and um <laughs> In the stealth and SWAT style of, of filmmaking, Mine Hunters. Whenever I see Val Kilmer, I I immediately think Iceman, and that kind of ruins it for me. Why? Oh, oh, Top Gun. Top I, Gun. I was thinking of uh, Marvel Comics, Iceman. No, for anybody that's 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 listening to this podcast, that tells a little bit about Joel's personality. He immediately that, jumps to X-Men? Marvel Comics and X Men. Couldn't help it. All right, so uh, we were talking about this before Exhibit. I thought he did a great job. I thought he was a very good part of this movie. One of my favorite parts, actually. His his acting was good. I uh, I liked how he was introduced. It introduced his character by reading his rap sheet for the crime he committed. And the first thing they mentioned was sodomy, which got a little <laughs> chuckle. Um, <laughs> yeah, he's a sodomite. <laughs> he is, he's, a, he's a sodomite, which is illegal in the South. Uh, little, little fun fact. Any act of sodomy is a crime. Sodomy including fellatio, not just... Uh, not just in the pooper. I'll, I'll look into that in case I'm down south, you know, just in case. Yeah, just keep your keep your ween clean when you go down south. Now, there was a a very nice cameo for me of a, a certain female police officer. Her name is like very kind of it's spelled very strangely. So this is how I think it's pronounced: Faruza Balk, F A I R U Z A. She has a very distinctive face. Oh yeah extremely distinctive and i don't think any human being save an albino has skin that's whiter than hers by, by, the, by the way uh you should know she co-starred with val kilmer in the island of dr moreau maybe we should watch that for the show yeah whenever i see her I, this is also strange i immediately jump to american history x yep yep and prior to that she was in the craft she was in the craft and <laughs> she has these teeth where when she starts laughing it, it's never genuine or funny. It's scary. She was in the Water Boy as well, right? Right after American History X, Water Boy. They had a very similar, I similar emotional content too. I've always American thought, History X and Water Boy. Yeah, I've <laughs> always thought that she was attractive, and I thought she looked great. What do you think? I disagree with you one hundred percent. I find her disgusting. Her teeth are right, enormous. We're, we're gonna have to fight. We're gonna have to fight on this one. I think she's. I feel smoking like hot. I feel like if her mouth got anywhere near your genitalia. She'd be going home slash, with it. Slash it she's, off. she's biting it. She's taking it home. No, she she's great. I thought she was hot. I was extremely disappointed. There's a scene in it where Nicolas Cage and Feruza Balk are in bed. Nicolas Cage is so drugged up. On heroin. <laughs> On heroin and, and everything that uh, he's just lying there while she is parading around in her lingerie. And they hint at a sexual encounter, but they never show it. I think what happened was... They were going to begin something, and he was so high in heroin that he just couldn't. Uh, he just he just couldn't he, could, he couldn't do it. <laughs> and she she got angry. I think he won out in the end because she probably would have bit his dick off. Why was Nicolas Cage? Uh, like there were certain scenes in this movie where he changed the sound of his voice. You remember that? I have it written down here, and it's not certain scenes. At one hour and four minutes into the movie, <laughs> his voice changes for the <laughs> remainder of the movie. And the movie is, I believe, 100 and, yep, 122 minutes long, so it's a little over two hours. So after an hour of the movie, after half the movie is over, he changes his voice, and it's very noticeable. And annoying. Very annoying. Yeah, he talks like this. Uh, yeah. Kind of like a ch- Yeah, that's a, that's a really like good a C. It's like a C-H ch- like sound in everything he says. Like, I, I thought that was really obnoxious. Like, through the whole movie, he's hunched over. It's like he's talking with dentures in his mouth. Yeah. Like after he, he, after half the movie is over, he puts in a pair of dentures and starts <laughs> starts doing the rest of the movie with dentures in. Like, I can handle he his He went through seven over. tubes of fix a dent. <laughs> like, he was all hunched over and slouched over, and I can handle, like, those weird things. But when he started talking like that, oh, oh. I'd had it. I'm really glad that you brought that up, the hunching. His, again, his physical acting... For having back pain or back problems, yes, was so over the top and unnecessary. I mean, if you have back problems where you don't need a cane or a walker or any other type of device to help you move, usually it's nuanced. But here, it's like he's walking like he's a robot. He was slouched over the whole time. Yeah, and walking funny. 
and talking funny. So, <laughs> he was a really unlikable, <laughs> very unlikable lieutenant, you know. <laughs> but I think that's the best he, I can say. He, about he was unlikable, but was he bad? Ah, uh, again, <laughs> yes, he was a very bad lieutenant. So the there's truth in advertising. But at the end of the movie, did he redeem himself? Did he become a quote unquote great lieutenant? He was a good. He was a bad captain. They, he got they promoted him. Oh, you're right. He wasn't a lieutenant at that point. <laughs> he, he was he was no longer a bad lieutenant. He became bad captain. Bad captain, and then redeemed to all right captain. Before we talk about the ending, which we need to talk about. Let's talk about the infamous breakdancing sequence in this movie. For those who haven't seen it, there's a part in this movie where Nicolas Cage is doing drugs, smoking crack, right? It was, he smoked crack, he did cocaine, and all of a sudden, it was it like a loan shark or something? Somebody that he owed money to entered the room. It was a mafioso character yeah, mob- that was hired. It was a mobster. Guy. Yeah, it was a, your stereotypical fat mobster Italian Don that was sent after him for... Stealing money from the son of a business real estate developer. Yeah, some some ridiculous thing like that. And then he comes into the room and Exhibit murders him. <laughs> <laughs> he shoots him and kills him instantly. But that the best part of the scene is that Nicolas Cage says this infamous quote. Shoot him again. His soul's still dancing. And then the camera in one take pans over from Nicolas Cage's face across the room to... <laughs> <laughs> to a man wearing the exact same clothes of the guy who's just shot. The guy, oh, for, for, again, for, for people that haven't seen this movie or this scene, the guy is a stout, yeah, he's a chubby, el- older, white-haired, white-haired white guy, man. Italian guy. The man dancing who's wearing the exact same clothes, which is supposed to represent this individual's soul. Is young. Is young. Fit. Fit. He's got a mohawk. A, it's like a green and, mohawk. And is, and, is, <laughs> and is probably Latino or yeah. African descent. And he's doesn't even, va- he's, yeah, he's wearing doesn't like even vaguely Chuck resemble Taylor's. this person in any way. <laughs> and he's break dancing. His soul is literally dancing. He's doing break dancing. <laughs> this scene makes no sense whatsoever at all. I don't. Th- it's like it came out of another movie, I think. Like that scene would make sense if we saw more stuff like that during the course of the movie. But... <laughs> Whoa, what'd you think of that? What'd you make of that this extreme scene? I loved Nicholas again, Nicholas Cage's face in this scene was phenomenal. He uh he has this like look of like childhood delight. Oh yes, yes. Where he is in complete wonderment I would over say this mild man. Break- <laughs> it looked he actually looks like Tom York singing, like like they injected an extra chromosome into his body <laughs> where so for, for for this scene. Yeah, he just has this he's got a little bit of down syndrome. It's worth seeing just for, <laughs> just for that. Yeah, for 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 anyone that hasn't seen this movie, go on YouTube and Look just up, uh, Bad Lieutenant. His soul is still dancing, and you will see what we're talking about. Totally worth it. Okay, let's, so, okay, let's talk about the ending of this movie. And I think this is important. It's worth discussing. <laughs> All right. So, in, in one of the last scenes of the movie, before this point of the movie, Nicolas Cage is in a lot of trouble. He owes money to the mob boss. Uh, the DEA is on him for manhandling an old lady, who's, harassing people. Who's, whose grandson is like a, a senator or something? Yeah, and he owes and he owes money to a uh, to his bookie. Yeah, so he has all these problems. Oh, and he still hasn't solved the murder <laughs> of these five people that he was supposed to solve in the beginning of the movie. So in the last scene of the movie, and this is not an exaggeration. People just line up <laughs> in front of his desk. This isn't like a metaphorical lineup. People literally line like his bookie is online. Yeah. The guy that that he shook down for money that had the mob sent after him is there. He's I, he was first in line, I think. So one after the other, these people show up and they say, hey, <laughs> hey, your problem solved. You're, you're, here's oh, the, the best part was the bookie came and he's like. Hey, here's ten grand. You owe me no money. Later, you won. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. Bye. <laughs> so he literally did nothing <laughs> <laughs> to deserve any of this good fortune. So in okay, any way. Let, let, let's run, let's let's run down all the bad things he's done. So he. There's no way that I'm going to be able to remember. All right, all right. Even so half of the bad things he he's done stole well. drugs from the evidence locker. He nearly murdered an old woman by c- cutting off her air supply. He because because he didn't get enough sleep. Yes, 
He yes. was just he was he was beat up, tired, and because he was tired, he didn't feel like wasting his time talking so, to her. So talking he, to her, so he decides to threaten her by killing her friend. <laughs> <laughs> So he does that. He sexually assaults a woman and does drugs with her. Uh, oh, he rigs a football game by <laughs> by pulling over. He pulls over the a, uh, football player. Uh, yeah, yeah, a, a, a key player on the team. Does he plant drugs on him, or did he have the drugs? No, he had marijuana on him. Yeah. Okay. So, so he rigged he rigged a football game. He, he did some extortion, <laughs> among many other things. Right. So he's a very bad character, very irredeemable. So how did the movie end? Everything turns out great. No punishment, nothing. He gets promoted. How do you feel about that? He, God, it's so fucking stupid. And, and, and he, he gets, does nothing he to gets, fix his problems. He, 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 gets, he, gets, he gets promoted. He cleans up his act drug-wise and morally. No, he doesn't. Does he? Yes, he does for that for that one scene. But at the end, he goes back to drugs. But but <laughs> But before that... At the award ceremony, everybody is clean. They show that by a waiter comes over, offers them wine. They're all they're like, "No, we're fine. We're all going to be drinking sparkling water." And they cheers with the sparkling water. <laughs> everybody in his family who was a drug addict is now clean. Oh yeah, that's, Eva, that's right. That's Eva, right. Eva Mendez is now pregnant. They're happy together that, in oh, yeah, love. That's right. I forgot about that. They're, She's pregnant. Yeah, they're in love now. There's going to be another, <laughs> maybe even worse, lieutenant <laughs> on his way. <laughs> And well, I mean, he's probably going to start it as a as a bad sergeant, work you, his way up. You got to start somewhere. You, yeah, you, private, you know, whatever. Yeah, yeah. He's going to be he's he's, he's going to be a bad patrolman yes, first, I'm and then he's going to go to bad sergeant, and then he'll be a terrible lieutenant. I think it's important though before you you actually talk about the last scene itself, you talk about the very first scene of the movie because they're they're linked together. Yes, there was a man. Trapped in the prison, he was drowning. Nicholas Cage jumped into the water to save him. The yeah. Last scene of the movie: Nicholas Cage is contemplating doing drugs again. He he literally has like a pound, like like a dinner plate filled with cocaine filled with coke in it's, front of him in a hotel room. There's there's like ten pounds of coke on it. And the man who he saved in the beginning, it's like it's like twenty thousand dollars worth of coke. I don't know where the fuck he got it from. Probably. Stole it from yeah, just stole Walker. it, I guess. I'm... Yeah, so the man he saved in the beginning reappears, and this time the roles are reversed, and he saves Nicolas Cage, I guess. And they go to the an, an aquarium and they hang out. The interesting imagery in this scene, though, is that they they go to the aquarium, and they're sitting equal to the floor of this enormous, you know, shark shark tank. There's sharks swimming around, you know, predators, and they're just sitting there kind of at the bottom drowning essentially i guess that would be the the imagery that it's supposed to conjure up because the initially the guy is in in the first scene of the movie the prisoner is going to drown and die and here they're just sitting there at the bottom of uh of this shark tank they're not actually under the water they're just sitting there outside of it yeah it was good uh, it was it good was, imagery it was good yeah, imagery I, I thought it was a pretty heavy-handed forced draw for emotional content i guess they were trying to show that he he was drowning in his own self-destructive behavior but that's kind of a stretch what do you think this movie cost to make i'm gonna go with the same one that i did for the last podcast i'm gonna say 30 mil okay that that's a very good guess and how much do you think it actually made Six. given this is an indie this was essentially an indie movie 60 i'm gonna say they probably doubled this movie cost a grand total of, are you ready? Go for it. $25 million to make. Okay. And it only made $10 million. Sorry, Werner. Better luck next time, huh? Yeah, I guess so. But I'll tell you this, the critics loved it. They ate it up. It holds an 87% around tomatoes. The tomatometer. The, uh, tomometer. Tomometer. Yeah, tomometer. Now, Ebert, Ebert declared... Nicholas Cage is as good as anyone since Klaus Kinski at portraying a man whose head is exploding. It's a hypnotic performance. You agree with that? Hypnotic performance? No. If it was, hyp- <laughs> if it was hypnotic, I wouldn't have been laughing the whole movie. I would have been entranced. Isn't that what that, that insinuates? I get, yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. All right, Martin. So on a scale of one to five, how many stars do you give Bad Lieutenant, Port of Call, New Orleans? I had a great time watching this movie. 
The story was decent. The acting was, well, we talked about the acting at length, so I'm not going to bring it up again. I'm going to give it a solid three. Three out of five. Okay. I'm going to give this the exact same score I gave the original Bad Lieutenant. A very low, almost teetering on a two. I'm going to give it a three. Just barely makes it for a three, I think. It was well-directed, right? It was nice. Nicolas Cage was insane. It's fun to watch. He was he was fun to watch. I'll tell you one thing. I got exactly what I was expecting and more from Nicolas Cage's performance. It's up there with like Daniel Day Lewis, like that in where there will be blood. Like it's that extreme and excessively over the top and look at me, I'm acting kind of thing, you know. It is. It's Nicolas Cage doing his best to do that. He's not Daniel Day Lewis. No. <laughs> no one's Daniel Day Lewis as far as acting is concerned. Yeah, well, Daniel Day Lewis, uh, <laughs> he didn't make the Sorcerer's Apprentice. So. You're you're right. He didn't make Face Off. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's pretty much it for Bad Lieutenant. This is the worst title: Bad Lieutenant, Port of Call, New Orleans. That's that's the end of that. Oh, that's a tough that's a tough movie to watch. Tough movie to review, <laughs> despite the fact that I'm giving it a positive score. It's a tough. Would you recommend Same. this to anybody? If I knew the person and. Uh, they were a fan of Nicolas Cage's over-the-top acting? Absolutely. How about you? Would you I would recommend this? people go to YouTube and look at the individual scenes. You wouldn't, you wouldn't suggest the that they thing. watch the whole movie? No. I, I tell would. them to go see the, the breakdancing scene, the old lady scene, the scene when he's in the, uh, the pharmacy and yelling at that lady. That was very funny. That's, a good, <laughs> that's, about, that's the extent as I would go with this movie. Just out of curiosity, what do you want to review, I guess, next time? You want to do uh, Island of Dr. Monroe? No. Jeez. All right. <laughs> no. Why? To, uh... to it's, it's, it's too close to my heart. <laughs> <laughs> well, whatever the case is. I'm thinking the two, the two movies that I'm thinking of, it's either Pandorum. Because too easy. Two movies that I know are going to be bad. So they'll be fun to review. So Pandorum or The Uninvited. Take your pick. Okay. I agree with you since this is, this is obviously something that's very novel to us. Let's uh, stick with the really, the really shitty crap movies that are... Really easy to rip apart and review. How do you feel about that? All right. Next week's episode <laughs> will be The Uninvited. <laughs> the movie's so bad. Maybe we'll have a title for this next time. I doubt it. But we'll <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I actually severely <laughs> doubt that we will have a title. We'll have for a title. Mix. We'll see what we can do. Maybe we'll get a special guest because Michael has seen this. Has he? Yeah, he has. So we'll, we'll get we'll, maybe we'll get him on this. We can get another microphone. Michael McDougal Fitzpatrick O'Flannery. O'Hara Kennedy. O'Hara Kennedy. Yeah, we'll get him on the phone. He's very Irish. Yeah, I guess that does it for this movie. So, so we'll see you next time. <laughs> <laughs>